Honorable Member for Hamilton East Stony Creek. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, I'm most pleased to rise today to take part in the debate on those pension reforms that are needed to protect and enhance the lives of Canada's seniors as they live out their sunset years. Now, Madam Speaker, you will know from my reports in this House that over the last 19 months that I've been crossing Canada holding uh, some 39 community meetings so far on what I call the Listening to Seniors Tour. And I want to assure you that Canadians have been very quick, these seniors have been very quick to tell me of their fears and their concerns about the future. And today, Madam Speaker, far too many of our seniors are forced to live in fear, just one crisis away from financial catastrophe. Now, seniors are worried about their private pensions and that how they might be significantly less than what they were told they would be, or as in the case of companies like Nortel, you know, where there was a significant loss to the amount of pension income. But they also worry that will they have a pension at all going forward. Now, Madam Speaker, the genesis of my seniors tour, or the listening to seniors tour, was when I was visited by a prominent group of seniors, an organization, and one of my guests stated to me that seniors feel invisible to their government. Now, this group also wondered why their government has spent or given $14 billion a year in corporate, corporate tax breaks while, as they said, doing nothing for them. Now, the government will argue that there were things done over the past five years on behalf of seniors, and some of that is factual, but from the point of view of the seniors themselves, they don't see that immediate impact for them. One of the things we heard talked about today was the corporate tax rate in Canada as compared to the United States. My understanding, I may be uh, incorrect, and it's my understanding the corporate rate in the U.S. is 36 percent, and we're nosediving to 15 percent, and we're taking the fiscal capacity out of this government to respond to seniors' needs. Last fall, Mr. Speaker, I told this House uh, something worth repeating. I'm, I'm sorry, I, the finance minister is trying to say something to me, but it's a little distracting. In the story of a senior who came to my office, and they had a letter from this government saying that his pension had been increased 42 cents a month. Now, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased that the finance minister is here to hear this. This man was so upset, he had tears in his eyes, and he said to me, and these are his words, not mine, not only does the government not give a damn about seniors, but it goes out of its way to insult us by sending us a notice that costs more to post than what it cost in the increase to the government. So he was, he was very concerned, and, and Mr. Sp Madam Speaker, rather, we faced down the worst recession in 70 years, and some credit should go to this government. But can Canadians throughout that process were vividly reminded why we have a social safety net in the first place. So having said this, I am pleased to see the government has taken an interest in reviewing the benefits paid under Old Age Security, GIS, and CPP. And I have to stress that this has also been done with an eye to increasing benefits for seniors. Now, in this House repeatedly tonight, we've heard references between 200 and 300,000 seniors who live before the poverty line. And an economist at the Canadian Labour Congress reported that the an annual infusion of about $700, $700 million would raise all seniors above the low-income cutoff, or as it's more commonly known, the poverty line. And we heard the Bloc speak a moment ago about a motion that they had before this House calling for an increase to GIS. Now, the 300,000 or 200,000 living below the poverty line is a, is a very sobering statistic. But when you consider of that number, Madam Speaker, 60% are single, unattached women, many of them women who never participated in the Canada Pension Plan because they, they stayed at home. To me, this is nothing short of a national disgrace. Madam Speaker, we can do so much more, and we must do much more for all senior Canadians. Now, today, only 38% of Canadian workers have workplace pensions. Nearly one-third have no retirement savings at all. And we, we have presented by the Liberals earlier today uh, a bill that talked about uh, guarantee, guaranteeing a charter for, for the rights of seniors to save, but 
the 38 percent of Canadian workers who are, are the one-third rather, that are outside of the umbrella of having a pension plan and cannot save at all, the value has to be questioned as to what this charter would do for them. More than 3.5 million Canadians are not saving enough in our RSPs, and I'm sure the Finance Minister can back that up. They're not taking advantage of the opportunity that is there, is presented by the government. 75% of private sector workers aren't even able to participate in a registered retirement plan. Clearly, the notion that retirement savings can be adequately accounted for through the purchases of our RSPs has not worked out and requires urgent government action. In June of 2009, the NDP Opposition Day motion started in a very public way a national discussion on the future of our retirement security system. And again, the members of this place today are taking part in that discussion and continuing it. But part of the discussion, from our perspective, centered around CPP and QPP and increasing uh, these funds. Now, I would remind members that CPP and QPP are self-financing, so it then becomes a question of whether Canadians are prepared to pay more for security in their senior years, and doing so as part of a secure public pension plan. Canadians certainly face insecurity day in the context of their private options, like RRSPs or defined contribution plans that leave Canadians uncovered or victimized by the market. Now, we believe there also would be a benefit to beefing up CPP, and that's the cheapest way for Canadians and the government to pool the risks, to take off from the individuals and secure their senior years. I would add that any voluntary supplemental CPP system will simply not meet the needs of Canadians any more than what an RRSP has done in the past. The NDP believes it's better to use the resources of CPP QPP to enhance our retirement system. And next, I, Madam Speaker, I'd like to discuss the need that Canada has for a pension benefits guaranteed fund. Federal leadership is urgently needed to set about working with the provinces to develop a pension insurance regime. This must be done to ensure workers actually receive the retirement benefits they have earned, even if their employer goes out of business. And I've said just a few moments ago in this place, we insure our cars, our homes, we have deposit insurance to cover our savings, so, so why not insure our pension plans? The system would be funded by contributions from the Federal Workplace Pension Plan sponsors administered by the federal government and designed to ensure efficiency and fairness to all parties. Another notable model that's worthy at least of study is the American Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporations, and there's some issues with that. And uh, similar to the Canada Canadian Deposit Insurance Corporation, the Pen Pension Benefits Guarantee Corporation is not, and I repeat, not financed through tax <coughs> revenues but by in pre, uh, in premiums paid by sponsors of defined benefit plans, assets from plans that are taken over, recoveries from refunded pension liabilities from plan sponsors, bankruptcy estates, and through in investment income. Now, Canada may choose not to follow the American model, but it can create some form of pension insurance uniquely its own, or a hybrid of other plans such as those in Switzerland and Sweden, Germany and Japan. <coughs> And even the Netherlands, which probably would be an option that we would not look at here, but the Netherlands as a government ensures the, the plans themselves. Once a guaranteed plan is successfully combined with funding rules and our other protection me measures, it can effectively perform its task as a last resort benefit protection measure. Now, Madam Speaker, another clause in our opposition day motion called for ensuring that workers' pension funds go to the front of the line of creditors in the event of bankruptcy proceedings. And I have the member uh, here tonight from Thunder Bay who was responsible for putting forward Bill C-501, which has been discussed earlier, and he's worked hard on that file, trying to protect the pensions and severance of uh, the workers across this country. Now, Canadians need to know that there will be a level of pension income for the retirement to ensure that they will spend their final years with financial security and live in dignity. And uh, I'm sorry, Madam Speaker, I thought I saw you giving me a signal. <laughs> I guess that means I've got to shorten this down just a little bit. So just in closing... ...and complete his uh, 
comments uh, following questions.